January 1924 saw a new political dawn. Britain's first Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, entered Downing Street. It had been a meteoric rise for the party, coming just 18 years after the election of the first Labour MP. It was vital for MacDonald to prove the Labour Party was fit for government. That meant introducing mainstream policies and distancing Labour from the more radical socialist elements of the British Communist Party. But Labour's first term in office was to prove short-lived. After just 10 months, MacDonald lost a vote of confidence and was forced into a premature election. The election had been predicted a long time because the government was a minority government, but it came in very odd circumstances. Uh, there was uh, a uh, leading article in a left-wing uh, journal, Workers Weekly, indeed a communist journal, edited by J.R. Campbell, uh, which was called Don't Shoot, and which urged the uh, soldiers who were working class people in the army not to take up arms and not to act if there were strikes. It was quite unexpectedly taken up by the Attorney General Patrick Hastings. Campbell was subsequently charged with incitement to mutiny, but without any warning, the Attorney General dropped the charges. There was an outcry in Parliament. The opposition claimed Labour was under the influence of extremist pro-communist elements in the party. Not only was there the Campbell case, but the government had begun talks over a trade treaty with Russia, which would include a loan of millions of pounds to Moscow. It proved deeply controversial. Inevitably, right-wing politicians raised the cry of the government being soft on the Communist Party, being perhaps even uh, in uh, um, uh, the uh, under the influence or even in the pay of uh, uh, the Bolsheviks or other uh, left-wing groups. And so the Liberals and the Conservatives came together to prosecute the government. Conservatives and Liberals banded together and called a vote of confidence in Labour. On the 8th of October, Labour ministers faced their critics in the House. MacDonald lost the vote. He was forced to call an election for the end of the month. As far as the opposition were concerned, there was only one issue at stake, Labour's ties to communist Russia, in short, the Red Menace. Then, just four days before polling day, a political bombshell burst. The Daily Mail ran a story claiming it had proof of the true links between Labour and the communist regime in Moscow. A very secret letter of instruction from Moscow, which we published below, discloses a great Bolshevik plot to paralyse the British Army and Navy and to plunge the country into civil war. The letter is addressed by Bolsheviks in Moscow to the Soviet government's servants in Great Britain, the Communist Party, who in turn are the masters of Mr. MacDonald. The Daily Mail claims were hugely significant. According to the article, the letter was written by Grigory Zinoviev, head of the Third International, the Soviet body responsible for overseas propaganda. In the letter, Zinoviev called on Labour activists to save the trade treaty from those who did not want it ratified by Parliament. It is imperative that the group in the Labour Party sympathising with the treaty should bring increased pressure to bear upon the government and parliamentary circles in favour of ratification of the treaty. Even more alarmingly, the letter called on British communists to prepare for armed revolution. It would be desirable to have cells in all the units of the troops, particularly amongst those quartered in the large centers of the country, and also among factories working on munitions and at military store depots. And there was more. The article claimed that MacDonald himself knew about the letter and had tried to cover it up. The opposition and the press had a field day. From the Tories' point of view, it was a gift from heaven. I mean. They're, they're long before the the, 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 the the letter came out four days before the polls, you know, so it was, it was, it was so late that it was hard to get any counter blast to it anyway. It was, such, it was, it was a magnificent time for, to, you know, to, to pull a fast one, if fast one it was. It was too late for Labour to turn the situation around. They lost the election to a Tory landslide. For many in the Labour Party, it was clear that they'd been swindled out of the election. 
for years, speculation grew over the letter, where it had come from, whether it was a forgery, and why it had appeared when it did. Countless theories blamed the secret intelligence service, MI5, the Conservative Party, and Foreign Office officials for conspiring to bring down Labour. But how much is true? Was the first Labour government the victim of a political plot? Had the establishment conspired against it? First are the allegations against officials at the Foreign Office. Could it be true that civil servants plotted the release of the letter to cause maximum political damage to their Labour masters? And is it true, as the press had claimed, that Macdonald had tried to suppress the letter and prevent it reaching the public domain? It was here in Melbury Road in West London that the Secret Intelligence Service, also known as SIS or MI6, had its headquarters. The letter arrived in a report from an SIS agent stationed in the Latvian capital Riga. It was assessed by SIS section head Desmond Morton. Propaganda from Moscow to the British Communist Party was not unusual, and Riga, due to its proximity to Russia, was a common source of intelligence on Soviet activities. What would happen now, if a Zinoviev letter arrived now, is that um, it would be considered by the Joint Intelligence Committee. What happens on the 9th of um, October 1924? So far as we know, there's just one individual he looks at it, oh yeah, seen plenty of stuff like that before, it's obviously genuine, I'll pass it on to the Foreign Office. Morton followed routine and passed the letter to the Foreign Office, MI5, and Scotland Yard with a note. The document contains strong incitement to armed revolution and constitutes evidence of intention to contaminate the armed forces. The authenticity of this document is undoubted. The following day, the letter arrived, along with Morton's cover note at the Foreign Office, where it was passed up through the chain to Permanent Under Secretary Sir Eyre Crow. Crow took the letter very seriously. Thanks, William. Certainly, he and other members of the Foreign Office were absolutely uh, anti-Bolshevik, um, and understandably so, because the Bolshevik foreign policy was completely disruptive. Macdonald had made it clear to his officials that he would not stand for acts of subversion by the Soviet Union. As far as he was concerned, cases such as this should be made public, so long as the British government could prove the documents in question were authentic. So before telling the Prime Minister about the Zinoviev letter, Crow wanted a guarantee that it was genuine. <laughs> Back at the headquarters of SIS, it was the job of Desmond Morton to prove its authenticity. My contact is a member of the Central Committee of the British Communist Party. Morton had According an undercover him, agent named Jim Finney within the Communist Party. According to Finney, senior party members had held a meeting two weeks earlier to discuss a letter they had recently received from Moscow. It was decided that particular efforts were to be made to permeate the armed forces of the Crown with communist agents, then to promote strikes and incite revolutionary action. It is hoped this last, by reason of the communist propaganda, which will have had effect, will either refuse to quell the disturbance or join the rioters. The similarities between the letter discussed at the Communist Party meeting and the one received by SIS were startling. As far as Morton was concerned, they were one and the same. This proved, he said, that the Zinoviev letter had been sent to the British Communist Party and it must therefore be genuine. Armed with this evidence, Crow decided it was time to inform the Prime Minister. But there was a problem. Macdonald was not even in London. He was touring the country on the campaign trail. Macdonald, who was the Foreign Secretary as well as the Prime Minister, he had to deal with all this. He was on the stump delivering about 20 speeches a day. He was never in Whitehall while all this was going on. He was all, you know, he was in Midlands and Wales all over, all over the place. 
and he was dealing with all this through boxes, you know, the, the, the official boxes. On the 15th of October, Crow wrote to MacDonald with his recommendation. Our best and only defence against these treacherous proceedings is publicity. It does not seem fair to our own people that our knowledge of the Russian machinations should remain forever concealed. It is not only our right, but almost a duty, to bring such cases of propaganda as the present one to the notice of the Soviet government. MacDonald agreed. He instructed Foreign Office officials to draft an official protest note to the Soviets. It is my duty to inform you that His Majesty's government cannot... Allow the note would put the British government's objections to the Zinoviev letter on the record. ...by a revolutionary institution established on foreign soil. But MacDonald was far from happy with the result. When he received the draft on the 22nd of October, he substantially rewrote it. MacDonald's out of town, he's electioneering, uh, he sees a draft, he amends it, he sends the draft back. And this, of course, is where part of the, um, the uncertainty occurs. He claimed subsequently that he had deliberately not initialed the draft so that uh, an amended draft would go back to him for further consideration. Without the Foreign Secretary's signature, officials would have no authority to release the document. Crow said he assumed, uh, he was quite sure on receiving MacDonald's first amendments, that that thereby authorised him to send the, the letter to uh, the Soviet charge. There's no way now of being absolutely sure what the misunderstanding was, but there clearly was quite a, a serious misunderstanding. By the time MacDonald's version of the protest note was received in Whitehall, it was the 24th of October. You have seen the amendments made by the Prime Minister. At 11 a.m., Crow met senior officials to decide what course of action to take. He was convinced the protest should be sent without delay, and he felt he had the authority to do so. At 4 p.m., the draft protest note was taken to the Soviet Embassy. Two hours later, the protest and a copy of the letter were given to the press. The draft was sent and that both the uh, protest note and indeed the text of the letter appeared in the Daily Mail without MacDonald being forewarned. So he was in the humiliating position of speaking at a public meeting when somebody said, what about this we see in the paper? And he hadn't been told. And I think as any prime minister would feel, he felt you know, um, very shaken and shocked and extremely angry about it. The evidence shows that MacDonald had intended to release the letter, but instead he was caught off guard by the Daily Mail headline. The result played straight into the hands of those who claimed ministers were indeed covering up their true ties to Moscow. The election had been about the Red Menace, so why didn't officials warn MacDonald that the letter was about to be released just four days before the election? While the Conservatives held talks on establishing a new ministry, MacDonald used his last remaining days in office to investigate what had happened. I remember that you had wished us to make quite sure of the authenticity of the Zinoviev letter. I had gone into this with great care and was entirely satisfied on the point. We had evidence, not only of the letter being sent from Moscow, but of its having been received here. This is, as a matter of fact, now further confirmed by the Daily Mail, having succeeded in obtaining the document. If anyone is to blame for your intentions being misunderstood, it must fall on myself. He was convinced the revised version of the note which MacDonald had sent gave him the authority to go public. MacDonald accepted his explanation that it was a bureaucratic error. Crow had simply misunderstood MacDonald's wishes. The inquiry exonerated the Foreign Office of any wrongdoing. Nevertheless, somebody did leak the letter to the Daily Mail, and many in the Labour Party believed the Conservatives were involved. After all, it was the Conservatives who'd gained most from the whole episode. Rumours about his party's role in the affair dogged the new Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin. 
so much so that eventually he went before the House of Commons with evidence which proved, he said, the true origins of the letter and how it had reached the press. The evidence was in the form of a statement produced by a former MI5 agent who claimed to be solely responsible for acquiring and publicising the letter. His name was Donald M. Thurn. Im Thurn had been an MI5 agent during World War I, but by 1924 he'd left the service for a career in the city. However, he remained well connected with the intelligence world. He had contacts with white Russian groups in London, he had contacts with MI5, he had contacts with SIS, he had contacts with the Conservative Party, and he had friends in the press. His statement detailed how, on the 8th of October 1924, a businessman friend told him about a letter which had been sent from Moscow to the British Communist Party. The following day, the friend was able to obtain a copy. I handed my copy of the letter, not to the Daily Mail Direct, but to a trusted city friend whom I knew to be in close touch with that newspaper and requested him to arrange for its publication. I would like to add that at no time did I obtain any information whatsoever with regard to the letter or its contents from any official source, and that from first to last, I was solely responsible both for obtaining the text of the letter and for securing its subsequent publication in the Daily Mail. Im Thurn went on to explain his motives. He felt that as the government was about to lend millions of taxpayers' money to Soviet Russia, he had a duty to publicise evidence of Russian subversion in Britain. I need hardly say that my action in this matter was solely dictated by patriotic motives, and that at no point whatsoever did I receive any payment, or any other reward, therefore. The statement was clear. The letter had reached the Daily Mail through a completely independent source. The Conservative Party was off the hook. It was only when Im Thurn's diary was uncovered over 40 years later that new light could be shone on the affair. According to his diary, Im Thurn did hear of the letter on the 8th of October, 24 hours before it arrived at SIS headquarters. His source was a figure known only as X. At the meeting, X told Im Thurn that Moscow was to begin a great propaganda war in England and that instructions had been sent to British communists. The identity of X remains a mystery, although it is possible that he was the same friend mentioned in the statement read by Baldwin. The following day, X contacted him again. October 9th. X rang up at 6 o'clock to say, so far nothing doing. Wonder what ought to do. Do nothing. Only hearsay so far. This is where the diary diverges from the statement read by Baldwin. According to the statement, Im Thurn had a copy of the letter in his hands on the 9th. However, the diary says the letter was only hearsay. He contacted an old friend, Major Guy Kindersley. It is this diary entry which is the most damaging for Baldwin, as Kindersley was a Conservative MP. October the 15th, rang up Kindersley told him to come up. 11 o'clock, Kindersley and I met Lord Younger and gave him the news. Wanted to guarantee against loss. At 3.30, we met Younger and Colonel Jackson. They gave me a guarantee and decided on Times publication. Lord Younger was the Conservative Party treasurer and Colonel Jackson, the party chairman. Within hours of approaching Kindersley, Im Thurn was meeting senior figures at Conservative Central Office to discuss how the letter could be used. The revelation completely undermined the statement read by Baldwin to the Commons. So did Im Thurn leak the letter to the Conservatives and the Daily Mail? 
for five days, he tried desperately to obtain a copy from his intelligence service contacts. But the evidence suggests he never even set eyes on the letter. He had good sources of information, although when I looked into him myself, I found no concrete evidence that he had actually had a copy of the letter in his hand at all. He had a kind of interesting role in sort of trying to hustle the le letter along. And uh, uh, I don't think it was a larger role as he portrayed for himself. Donald M. Thurn had provided the evidence which enabled Stanley Baldwin to deny that the Conservative Party had anything to do with the publication of the Zinoviev letter. Yet the evidence in M. Thurn's diary shows that the Conservatives knew about the letter two weeks before it was made public. Once Central Office knew of the letter's existence, the Conservatives could turn to any number of former and serving intelligence men who they could rely on. You're talking about a very small circle of people at the top, whether it's intelligence, um, senior officials, ministers, press barons. It's not like if you were talking about it now. You know, even now, there are certain prominent ones. But then you, a social circle, really quite small. I have no doubt that there were individual officers, particularly in the Secret Intelligence Service, who were very worried that the government was in effect suppressing information that was of enormous political significance. And the temptation to leak must have been overwhelming. The probable sequence of events is that uh, somebody in Whitehall, not necessarily, but quite possibly in one of the intelligence services, and SIS is the most probable one, uh, leaked it to some former member uh, of uh, one of the intelligence services, and that they then uh, took it on themselves to leak it to the Daily Mail. One possible source is a former director of naval intelligence who had close ties to the party. Thomas Marlow, the editor of the Daily Mail, said that he received the letter from an old and trusted friend. Now, the old and trusted friend was almost certainly, but not absolutely certainly, Admiral Sir Reginald Blinker Hall, former director of naval intelligence and former high official in Conservative Party office. He was called Blinker because of his habit of blinking very rapidly. During his time in intelligence, Hall had amassed a considerable reputation. He was famed for decrypting the Zimmermann telegram, a secret document sent by Germany to persuade Mexico to invade the United States and enter World War I. There's good circumstantial evidence in his case that he did leak the Zinoviev letter um, because he had leaked such things before. On leaving the service, he went on to become a Conservative MP and senior official at Central Office. He's photographed here with Sir Stanley Jackson, the party chairman. The fact that the letter reached the Daily Mail just two days after it was widely circulated amongst intelligence staff backs up the theory that it was leaked by someone with strong intelligence connections and Blinker Hall is a prime candidate. But what about the claims that the letter itself was a forgery? The evidence that it was genuine came from the Secret Intelligence Service. However, archive documents cast serious doubt over the accuracy of the evidence. They said that they knew the identity of everybody who had handled the letter um, between it, uh, its being supposedly copied in Moscow to reaching SIS, and that just wasn't true. The evidence was collated by SIS officer Desmond Morton. In this particular case, we are aware of the identity of every person who handled the document on its journey from Zinoviev's files to our hands. It came from an agent in Moscow for a long time in our service and of proved reliability. They didn't actually know the identity of the supposed agent who had supplied the letter to Riga station. Uh, and they never did. And although they asked Riga, Riga never gave a satisfactory um, answer to this. Simply saying the Riga station, ah, oh, that makes it sound, doesn't it, as if there was a sort of office busy with intelligence officers coming in and out and secretaries moving in and out and uh, people reporting on contacts and this and that. You know, it wasn't one man and a dog. It was more likely one man and a secretary um, and um, a, you know, just a occasional assistance. So, you know, 
what they depend on, to some extent, um, are networks which are not directly run by SIS. One frequent source of anti-Soviet intelligence were networks of so-called white Russians. The civil war which followed the Russian Revolution had split the country between Bolsheviks and pro-monarchy white Russian groups. The problem was that as well as supplying genuine information, they often produced fake Soviet propaganda aimed at discrediting the regime. But SIS had an answer for that. We made it our special business to be acquainted to the methods and personnel of the various white Russian and other forging organizations, especially the main one in Berlin, with the object of preventing ourselves from having forgeries planted on us. The Berlin organization referred to by Morton was headed by one of the most notorious anti-Soviet forgers, Vladimir Orlov. Orlov was uh, a committed white Russian. He was an opponent of the regime. Uh, his uh, sole purpose in life was to undermine the Bolsheviks, to restore uh, Tsarist old Russia, and he was a very skilled forger. And for many years he continued peddling information and documents and pamphlets and other material that he claimed had come from sources within the Bolshevik movement, but actually they were just very skilled uh, forgeries. SIS claimed that because they kept an eye on the Orlov ring, it was impossible for a forgery to be slipped into the system. This is really an impossible um, proposition to, to substantiate, because after all, if it was a forgery designed to be fed into the British system and disrupt, then they're hardly going to um, make a song and dance about it. Somebody would be doing it much more subtly than sending it through Vladimir Orlov. Or if it were Orlov, uh, he would have done it a lot more um, carefully than his, his usual forgeries. The dossier supplied by SIS raises serious doubts about the source of the letter. It also seems that the original evidence produced by SIS to prove the letter was genuine was also flawed. My contact is a member of the Centre. It was Morton's evidence, based on reports from his undercover agent, Jim Finney, which had been used to authenticate the letter. But according to SIS records, Finney's report made no mention of the Zinoviev letter. What appears to have happened is that Finney sent in a report around about the same time saying that, oh, well, yeah, the leadership of the British Communist Party has been discussing all these kind of things, but never saying it has actually just received a message from Comintern saying uh, that um, uh, this is what it should, should do. And uh, the SIS desk officer who was dealing with it jumped to the conclusion that um, what Finney was describing about a discussion within the British Communist Party leadership actually proved that they had received the Zinoviev letter. When I looked into this and I found Morton's report of his meeting with his informant, that's not what the informant had said at all. He hadn't given, there was no mention of a letter. There had been a discussion, but not of a letter, the Zinoviev letter or any other letter. So actually what Morton claimed was evidence letter, of authenticity. It was not at all. From the Labour SIS Party. did not know the source of the letter. The evidence that it had been received by the British Communist Party was unfounded, and the claim that the intelligence services could not be fooled by a forgery is impossible to prove. So, given the lack of evidence, why did SIS put so much effort into proving the letter was genuine? I think SIS realised pretty quickly that it wasn't actually genuine, but they had got themselves into a bit of a corner. Having authenticated it for the Foreign Office, they were not going to go back. This is no way to run an intelligence service, but if you're as minute in size as SIS was at that point, you have only one of two choices, either say, look, we're so small, we can't cope with this, or, well, yeah, we're very short staff, we have to reach decisions quickly, this is the decision, and they got it terribly wrong. So, if it was a forgery, who did write the Zinoviev letter and why? I think the best guess is that it was a white Russian forgery. Um, and, but it was 
done by somebody who had good connections, good intelligence connections with probably uh, British and Russian intelligence because whoever it was, they knew how to frame the letter and how to put it into the system in such a way that it would be taken as genuine. We don't think that it was actually produced by the original forgers to influence the election. What we think the forgery was for was actually to, to, to disrupt the Anglo-Russian trade treaty. The individuals who forged the letter remain a mystery. There are a whole series of people who could have done it. I could have done it. Um, most other people could have done it. What do you need? All that you need is uh, access to some genuine Comintern uh, documents. Uh, these could be published documents. I mean, the Comintern, after all, kept publishing policy statements on this, that, and the other. So what do you do? All that you have to do is get hold of one of the published Comintern statements and turn it into a letter addressed to a particular Communist Party. And that's what happened in this particular case. The letter was a forgery produced by white Russians to discredit the Soviet regime. Once it reached London, it was used in an entirely different context and held up as evidence of Labour's complicity with the Bolsheviks. Although there's no evidence of any institutional conspiracy, the motives of certain individuals, particularly Desmond Morton, remain a mystery. Did he know the letter was a forgery when he authenticated it? We'll never know. Whether the Zinoviev letter really lost the election for Labour is debatable. The party increased its popular vote by almost a million. It is entirely understandable that having uh, been the victims of this extremely disreputable publicity stunt, members of the first Labour government uh, should have taken a less detached view and seen a relationship of cause and effect between the publication of the Zinoviev letter on the one hand and the end of the first Labour government on the other hand. I think few historians would follow them. Nevertheless, the Zinoviev affair remains a most extraordinary and mysterious business. <laughs>